everybody, welcome into the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, a proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Checking. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. As a reminder, we are available on all podcast platforms, so be sure to rate and subscribe. Tony and Drake here, joined by Andy Martinez, Tim Stebbins, our resident uh, uh, freelancer, I guess, uh, contributor. MLB, contributor, yeah, MLB.com's oh, own Tim Stebbins. Uh, but guys, we are post-deadline. It felt like uh, a long time coming in some ways, like the deadline, maybe just because it was August 1st, like it felt a little bit later than in some of the past years, but it was a hectic deadline, except the day before the deadline, really, for the Cubs. It was kind of quiet for the Cubs on the actual deadline day, but Andy, we'll start with you. What do you make of what the Cubs did, obviously adding Jamer Candelario being the, one of the biggest names on the entire market? Yeah, I think that that was my main takeaway, was that it was a lot bigger than I thought it would be. You know, Same. when the Cubs kind of, you could kind of see that they were going to be buyers, and, and Jed Hoyer mentioned it, that there was two games where we kind of realized, like, yeah, we're for sure buyers. It was the Cubs come back against the White Sox when they were down 7-2, to two, and then the Mike Talkman catch game where the players were on the field celebrating it and just going crazy after that. Um, those were the two games that kind of solidified in Jed Hoyer's mind. And once you started realizing that they were buyers, you're starting to look at, like, what can this team do to solidify their position or to, to, to try and chase down the Brewers and the Reds. And you figured first base or third base would be some sort of addition, but I never really kind of considered Jamer Candelario as an option just because it seemed so almost far-fetched, right? Like it seemed like the top guy on the market that you didn't think, you thought someone else would overpay in terms of of, uh, prospect capital or or, or trade package. So I never thought Jamer Candelario was really that big of an option, but Jed Hoyer mentioned that that was their number one target. And as him and Mike Rizzo, the, the Nationals GM, president of baseball operations, started talking, it kind of became clear. Like, there was a match and there was, there was a pathway to get it done. And to get arguably the best bat on the market, like you said, I think kind of showed the rest of the division. Like, the Cubs are for real and they're, they're, they believe that they can go out and, and chase down the Brewers and Reds and, and make a run at the division. Yeah, Tim, I mean, I think... Candelario went out and proved that he's the best bat, right? Because he's hitting 800 in a Cubs uniform right now. But no, obviously, you know, it was one game and lineup looked great. But just in general, Tim, like what, what did you make of the Candelario edition? What the Cubs did do, what they didn't do, whatever. I was definitely uh, pleasantly surprised for them that they got Can- uh, Candelario, excuse me. Like, as you're saying, of all the bats out there, and there wasn't, once Cody Bellinger and Shoh- Shohei Otani, for example, aren't getting traded, like Candelario stands out among uh, the potential trade chips that were out there, and they got him, and I think it's a great fit. And I was also, for their sake, like like surprised and kind of like pleased that for their prospects that they had to part with, you know, like Kevin Maude, DJ Hers, like those guys are like good prospects, and those guys were definitely coming up in the system. But what we saw the last couple of years in selling is that uh, they accumulated a lot of prospect depth and built up their farm system. This is exactly what it's for, right? Like they didn't have to trade any of their, their top-tier starting pitching prospects, the Jordan Wicks, Cade uh, Horton, Ben Browns of the world, and DJ Hers is still a good prospect, but this is kind of the whole point in, in getting a deeper farm system. It's for when you are in a position to contend to dip into it. So in that sense, uh, I really like it because those guys might have good careers, but perhaps they also might have been blocked here. I did think bullpen help was an area that I would have liked to see them address, especially the left side. and. You know, Mark Leiter Jr. has done a great job as a right-hander against lefties. We know that. But I think that was the one area that I was kind of waiting until that deadline for them to do something. They didn't. And I understand what Jed Hoyer was saying, too, that it was a seller's market. Uh, I think if you look at some of the lefties that were out there just in the rumor mill, like Aaron Bummer, Brooks Raley's of the world, like, they didn't even get traded. So maybe that speaks to what he's saying. Um, And in any case, they're going to have to ride with what they've got. But at the end of the day, they did get better. Yeah, and I kind of want to go back to what you were saying at the start about the prospects the Cubs gave up. I think that's such a great point is that that you're right. That's exactly why you accrue prospect depth. And a big factor with both of those guys is they're going to be Rule 5 eligible this winter. So the Cubs already had a 40-man roster crunch last year. Of course, they're going to have another crunch this year. I mean, there are several other prospects that are, you know, a little bit closer to Chicago even that are going to be have to added to the 40-man soon. You know, Pete Armstrong doesn't have to be added this year, but maybe he will end up being added at some point. Obviously, he is in AAA now knocking at the door. But, you know, DJ Hers it was 15th on Lance Brasdowski's preseason rankings. Kevin Mate, I believe, was 29th. So, like, 
these are guys um, that were in the back half of the Cubs, like top 30 in, in terms of their system. So hers is a guy that, you know, I know Cubs fans have kind of fallen in love with a bit, a lot of strike, you know, big strikeout numbers, um, but still in double A, you know, not a guy that like was necessarily going to help the team even next year, possibly like right. it, it, it could have happened, but like as a lefty, maybe as a reliever is more of his future, who knows? Um, but yeah, I think, you know, to go out and get a potential game-changing bat in Candelario, which, as you guys have said, Andy, you brought up the point, he was essentially the only type of game-changing batter, or one of the only. Like, he, he's in that same kind of category that Nick Castellanos was in 2019. Now, Castellanos really took off, and then since then has had a $100 million contract and, and done well for himself. But, like, at the time, you thought of Candelario about the same time, the same way that you thought of Castellanos, right? Like, they were the similar type of hitters. So I'm not saying that Candelario is going to hit 320 and, you know, have a home run every other day or a double every other day like, like Castellanos did. But I, I agree with you that, like, this is why you have the prospect depth. And, and also, like, what better time to go in than right now? For me, the White Sox game, I think, really sold it that, like, this team, this could be a special season. This is a team to kind of go all in on. But also, like, you know, why not? Like, I, I, I didn't find a good enough reason to say why not. To, I, I feel like I felt, and maybe it's because we're talking to these guys, and I've heard Nico Horner say it several times, like, he would love to go to, to battle with this group and see what that looks like over the rest of the season. I started believing that, and I think Jed did too, but like I wanted to see what happened with this team. So I think it's cool that they're buying. I mean, the first time in Marquis history in a non-pandemic season that they're buying in that August and September have real legitimate, fun, entertaining, meaningful games at Wrigley. And Andy, you said it when we were talking last night, like imagine, you know, Tuesday night, like like the, the vibes, the atmosphere for an yeah. August 2nd game is just so different than it was last year or two years ago and it, it's going to be awesome to see this energy around Wrigley so like I'm very happy in the sense of like it'll be fun to cover it and like you know again no rooting interest like whatever but I I didn't want to cover another sell-off I didn't right. want to regardless of whether it's just a couple guys I wanted to cover a team that was buying and there was going to be entertaining meaningful games in August and September and now we're going to get that so like I'm happy from that sense yeah and and I want to bring back two points the the bullpen help I agree with you I thought there was going to be some some sort of yeah. movement to to bolster the bullpen there was I mean they added Quas from from the Royals for Nelson Velasquez and they added Roberson so I think it's kind of an under the radar pickup if you look at his last 10 outings he really has kind of picked it up in AAA um, with Tampa Bay. Like, that was kind of an interesting pickup, and sometimes those are the kind of guys that kind of fly under the radar that could provide some depth. But the, the lefty was really the, the thing that stood out to me because I thought there, it, it, there was a natural fit for a need and just what was available in the market. But the more I thought of it last night, I was really thinking about it like Brooks Raley, Aaron Bummer, those two guys were kind of like the two... I'll say like the two Jamer Candelarios on the pitching yeah. side from a left-handed market, right? They were like the two prized possessions... And if you think about it, like the White Sox have clearly said, like they still believe they can compete in 2024. Aaron Bummer's con under control through 2024. So like, if you think about it, they were probably asking for a lot, yeah. given that they think they can contend next year, that maybe Jed Hoyer and the Cubs weren't ready to to, to separate with that. And Brooks Raley, I believe, is under control through next year too yes, yeah. with the Mets. So the Mets, they, they want to reload next year too. So like the, the, the asking price probably didn't fit. Whereas, like, with Candelario, it was a rental. The Nationals were going to lose him either way. Kind of made more sense that you could to be able to go out with him. And DJ Hurst, to me, was a really interesting guy because he's a guy that I think is a prime uh, lottery pick in the Rule 5 draft, right? Like, he's probably – he could be a reliever in the future. And a team might just say, hey, like, let's take him in the Rule 5 draft and we'll, use, we'll stick him in our bullpen for the whole year and, and see if it pans out. And then if that was the case, then the Cubs lose him for nothing. At least this – in this situation, you get two months of Jamer Candelario, which one day in is already looking pretty good. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and um, I, I agree with you. Like I, with both of you guys, I really thought they were gonna go out and get a left-handed reliever, um, and I think that that was that was what I thought. And when people had asked me before and uh, what the Cubs might do at the deadline if they did buy, I was like left-handed relief help. Like that was the number one thing that I thought they would do. I thought they'd add more on the edges. I was surprised about that Candelario too, you know, the one big bat. But uh, Tim, as we look at Candelario's addition onto this team, how, how does this new look lineup kind of look to you with him, you know, probably primarily playing first base and getting most of the at-bats, at least the way the Cubs are kind of lining it up now? I was surprised at some of the initial reactions by some people who were 
disposing Nick Madrigal to a bench roll because I know Jamer Candelario is up there among third basemen in like defensive metrics, like outs above average, but who's right behind him or right there with him is Nick Madrigal, whose bat, by the way, has come along pretty pretty solidly lately. So um, the one on the one hand, like, yes, he hadn't played first base since 2020 and in that sense, like, okay, maybe you, maybe you think you put him at third, but, like, I think they really, really like Nick Madrigal over there. And when you got a guy like Steele on the mound and there's ground balls going to Madrigal's way, not that Candelario couldn't make it, but how can you make the best possible lineup infield? It's probably having them both in there at the same time, and you know you have a capable guy at third uh, with Nick Madrigal. And, and I know Candelario last night, like, there was the air early on, but I expect as time goes on, he'll get more comfortable there. And I think uh, you obviously have Patrick Wisdom who can be in the mix, but I think... Nick Madrigal is still getting steady playing time is the best version of this team. It's not someone who's just not, he's not someone who you play sparingly. Like he has contributed to this team's success. Uh, in that sense, I like that they're going to put Candelario at first, and, and that lengthens the lineup, I think, as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think Madrigal, he's also a guy who I think needs to play every day in order to really have his swing and his timing down and to see the best version of yourself. But I've been really surprised and impressed with his defense over at third base. And Patrick Wisdom has had some really nice moments over there, but also has made some mistakes at third. So yeah, I think, I, you know, Madrigal playing against most right-handed pitchers for sure. And, and maybe even just in an everyday role. Uh, I was a little surprised though, that Candelario, that the Cubs acquired him and you know, that they're going to roll with him at first. It had been a few years since he had even played first. He has had some experience over there, but it, you know, has never really been like an everyday first baseman. He's mostly been an everyday third baseman with some starts at first and DH kind of sprinkled in. But you know, Andy, as you looked at this lineup with him in there for the first time, uh, you know, Bellinger out in the outfield, like defense offensively, like what, what did you look at and, and stood out to you most about adding a bat like that? To me, the biggest thing was just how lengthened the lineup was. Yeah. And it was interesting, la last week uh, in St. Louis, the Cubs were talking about how their offense, or their lineup, excuse me, felt so deep. And, and it was a really long lineup, and it was a really, really, Jameson Tyon said he wouldn't want to face it. And I'm like, they're really clicking right now. And yes, that is the case. Like everyone was hitting over the last week or so. But you kind of thought, like, if you could add one more bat, right, at first base or third base that could fill that role, like, that would really, really lengthen the lineup. And you saw that right away um, against the Reds in that first game where Jamer Candelario, again, your big addition, is hitting six. And that's five to nothing, and he comes up to the plate. And it would have been easy to kind of, like, roll things over. You got five runs on the first. It's easy. He gets a single. Then the offense kind of keeps going after that. They, they bring nine guys up to the plate. It really, really lengthened the lineup, which, okay, especially against the Reds, the Reds, I think the Reds might have the best offensive potential in the division, just yeah. given, I mean, they still scored nine runs after giving up 20, but that, that is kind of how you're going to have to beat the Reds. You're going to have to, you're going to have to outslug them. You're going to, you're going to have to put up a lot of runs. And that was the case on, on Tuesday night, right? Where it seemed like they just kept getting runs and runs and, and they had a base runner on in every single inning in, on Tuesday night. They scored in all but two innings. Like they just put together good at bats, and that lineup is just so much deeper just with the insertion of Jamer Candelario. And there's going to be lulls, right? Like they're not going to put up 20 runs every day. Every day they're not going to bring a base runner up every single game. But like that is a, an initial sign that things are already improving and things will will continue to get better for the Cubs offensively. And the lulls are less likely to be pronounced when you add a guy like Candelario, a switch hitter who uh, particularly hits right-handed pitching well as another left-handed bat, again, who can play multiple positions. Like, there's just more versatility. So, yes, there is more length in the lineup for sure, but just, I think, the versatility up and down the lineup. And Candelario is having the best offensive season of his career, but he's a three-win player, you know, because of the defense. Like, he is second to only Dansby Swanson on the team in terms of war right now. Uh, but you know, he can do a lot of different things. He can hit the ball out of the ballpark. He's a doubles machine and, and was, you know, in his time in Detroit too. So I agree with you guys. I mean, um, I think it definitely lengthens, lengthens the lineup, but it's also, I think, really interesting some of the ripple effects that'll happen with him in town here and how that impacts the rest of this team. Because we see, it, you know, it certainly has seemed to materialize that Christopher Morrell is the DH moving forward. And that has already been the case for a little bit. And Andy, you had a great story a few weeks ago about Morrell adjusting to the mentality of playing DH and not playing in the outfield um, or just anywhere in the field all the right, time. Right. And he obviously provides depth at, at middle infield or the outfield as well. But, you know, I think he's the DH moving forward. He's really kind of settled in. You know, he's at DH in 24 starts. He's hitting just shy of 300, over 900 OPS. 
five homers, 20 RBIs in 24 games. Like he has really come around in that role, continues to develop. Uh, he's on a nine game hitting streak entering Wednesday's game. So I think the Morel situation at, at full-time DH is one thing, but also I'm really curious to see how Seiya Suzuki's role fills in now because Mike Talkman has played so well. We've heard Ross say for several months now, the best version of this team is Talkman leading off. And then obviously Bellinger, if he's not playing at first, is in center. Morel's taking DH. I mean, I, I don't know. Like they can continue to rotate guys, but the way Seiya has been playing and, you know, he has a sub 600 OPS since June 1st, over two months of action. He has a 578 OPS. I'm just starting to wonder more and more if Seiya is limited to more of a part-time role with Candelaria's arrival. Yeah, it's it's interesting what kind of happens there because we saw it day one. And, and part of it, too, was he's been really, really struggling, especially as of late, yeah. that a, a, a day off kind of just made sense, right? Day, like yes. the, the mental day off. And and I, I I saw some people, especially on social media, like let him get in that bed against against Luke Maley, the position player, which to me I'm like just give him the full day. Like let him rest. Like there's, there's no sense in – because like – I think there's only more bad that can happen, right? Like if he like grounds out or something, that that, that doesn't really help. But it's it's interesting what happens because you're right. Like Mike Talkman's a really good defender too, so yeah. it's not like you're losing a whole lot by putting him in right and and not having say out there. It, it creates so much more flexibility, but I also think it maybe gives him a little bit of time to figure it out, right? Like where he's playing in a more sporadic role, and and it allows him to to kind of figure it out. Again, this is something that we've talked about that Jed Hoyer's mentioned before, like. Those are good problems to have, right? If you're talking about your one of your big acquisitions from last year, um, trying to figure out where he fits, like that's not the worst problem to have. It's not an ideal problem to have, but it's 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 something that it'll be interesting to see how it plays out because that that is one of the things you're gonna have to look out for and, and see what kind of happens with him. Yeah, Tim. I mean, what do you, what do you make of like you talked about the ripple effects from Candelario on Madrigal in third base, but you know Morel at DH or the outfield picture. Like, what do you make of of how this plays out with Candelaria now in town. Like you just said, I mean, it's interesting, man. Like you have, you have options here, right? Like we say like Madrigal's at third and, and uh, Candelario's at first, that means Bellinger's in center. And uh, you have, you want Talkman in the lineup often like right, right field is where he was, was it last night, right? So, yeah. I mean, look, like I think they need Seiya Suzuki to, I think their lineup is better when he's in it, when he's right. But like right now, as we're saying, like it's been a bit of a struggle here. And maybe it is just a matter of like, you know, let him figure some things out. And the, you have options here where you start with matchup based and he gets kind of on track and, and then go from there. But like, yeah, I mean, there's been some swings, I think, lately where he's kind of been in between. And, and maybe it is just a matter of like letting him kind of mentally reset and uh, get back in there. But I, I think, look, like, man, like, I think it's good to have options. like. Not to not to compare 2023 to 2016, but that team had options, and you you didn't you had like it's kind of like the Reds. I'll just compare it to them. The Reds have like when Jonathan India is on the injured list right now, when he's healthy, you have nine guys for or ten guys, I guess, for nine lineup spots. And I think if Seiya Suzuki's right, the more options you have, the better, and you go from there. But uh, I think right now with with how he's going, like maybe it is a matter of just letting him kind of work on some things and, and know in the meantime you have capable guys to to fill in when he's not in the lineup. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I think Talkman's ability to play all three outfield spots is huge. You know, you can give Hap a day off here or there. You can give Bellinger a day off. You can maybe give Morell a day off and have Hap DH and Talkman play left and say a play right. Or again, you know, injuries will happen. And like, you, you know, yes, it's definitely good to have options. But I think the fact that we're even talking about this is uh, really just kind of fascinating because that's not the way anybody thought this playing out with Seiya, right? Like they signed him to an $85 million, you know, five-year deal plus like the posting fee that took it over $100 million total from the Cubs perspective. Like it was, they signed him as a star. He's getting paid like a star. And for some portions of his time here, he has played like a star. And yeah. I really thought he was going to hit the ground running in year two, feel a lot more comfortable in the U.S., his second year here, uh, just understanding the American game. I thought we would see that. Obviously, the oblique injury in spring limited him the first two, three weeks this season. That impacted it for sure, but I, I mentioned June 1st <clears throat> for his slump. Before June 1st, he was saying 293, 385 on base, 872 OPS. Like He was performing like a star. We've seen him make some really nice defensive plays. I mean, robbing the Grand Slam in uh, you know, against the White Sox the day before that big comeback was was huge and a pivotal moment in that game. So I think he has performed like a star in stretches, 
but it's the consistency that needs to get there. So that's what I am curious about too, is it's, it's hard to find consistency if you're not getting consistent playing time. And I just don't know exactly how this plays out. But to me, this is an indicator that between that and the Trey Mancini move, to clear room for Jamer Candelaria, and we haven't even talked about Mancini leaving, right. but those moves to me, you know, say a sitting and, and maybe sitting moving forward, we'll, we'll again, see how things play out. But cutting ties with Mancini, a guy you had signed a two-year deal, a huge clubhouse guy, a veteran presence, was, again, one of the bigger bats on the market. When the Cubs signed him, nobody said this was a tough move and not going to work out, or whatever. It was universally panned as a good move. And so, like, um, for that, to the Cubs to make these moves, it shows how aggressive they are. It shows, even just beyond acquiring Jamer, that they're going, not all in, right, Like, but they're going for it this season. Right. And I think those aggressive moves, to me, speak just as much as going out and getting Jamer Candelaria. Yeah, and that's that's a good point, especially, like, we didn't we haven't mentioned Trey Mancini, but, like, it would have been, the easy choice would have been to, you know, Patrick Wisdom isn't as hot as he has been. You could have said Patrick Wisdom will get options, we'll keep Trey Mancini, we'll see if we can figure it out. It's, it's August, uh, it was at the end of July when, it, like, he hadn't figured it out. Like, yeah. there's only so much time you can try give, to give a guy to figure it out. And, and Jed Hoyer said it, you know, sometimes a guy comes in and you have these expectations and he exceeds them, and just sometimes it doesn't happen. And that was the case with Trey Mancini. And, you know, it was unfortunate for both sides because when it happened in the offseason, I thought that, that was a really logical fit for both sides, right? I thought Trey Mancini, there was a need at first base. He's coming off winning a World Series. He's a guy who had 35 home runs in 2019. Like I thought that fit just made a ton of sense mm-hmm. uh, in the offseason. And and even looking back on it, like it still make, makes a ton of sense just given what they needed. Um, it just, uh, for, frankly, didn't work out like that. And, again, would have been easy to, to say, we'll, we'll give him more time to let it figure out and we'll send Pet- Patrick Wisdom down or maybe even Nick Madrigal. But, no, the Cubs said that they know that their best roster features Patrick Wisdom and Nick Madrigal getting at-bats. And that meant that the odd man out was Trey Mancini. And they, I mean, like all year with first base, we know first base has been uh, like a spot in their lineup where the production hasn't been compared to other spots, right? Like you started with the first move, right, Eric Hosmer. And they, they went with Matt Mervis and gave him some run. A little bit of struggles, maybe some bad luck involved where uh, the numbers weren't what they, you know, how hard he was hitting the ball, he wasn't getting results. But they gave him some run, it didn't, wasn't working out, so he went back down. Uh, now this case too, like they've, they're, they're like we're saying they are going for it, right? Like in, to another point, like you're saying, wisdom, madrigal, like you know, Miguel Amaya. You have three catchers. Maybe right. it's a matter of we'll keep the veteran bat who uh, has been until this year like a steady guy and and use our options and, and give it more time. But uh, I think this makes once you have Candelario in the mix, like I I kind of was surprised that because Mancini's on a two-year deal that they would just move on from him that way. But I think that's uh, that speaks that spoke volumes to me is all I could say really like. The guy's a veteran. He's making he's two money next year, and they said, you know, we're in the best interest of us right now, based on how he's playing. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna part ways. So I think that spoke volumes. Yeah, and I think too the other factor, and you know, I touched on it a bit was just how valued he is. He was in the clubhouse, Mancini, yeah. like a guy who won the World Series with the Astros last year. But this is a guy who beat cancer. You know, is one of the best guys in baseball and has been for a long time and uh the way that he is as a teammate and like again like everybody in there has said nothing but great things about him and his work ethic everything he brought his veteran and steadying presence throughout the ups and downs earlier in the season whether he was playing or not uh he definitely had a a big impact on the team so and and that presence that you know world series type of experience was helpful but yeah, you know, at some point, like you can't just carry a guy who's not going to end up playing right. on your roster. Right, and and I, I remember in Milwaukee, uh, Fourth of July weekend, there's a it's a big series, right? And you know the trade deadline's less than a month away, and it's this big moment. And I remember a veterans meeting with David Ross, and who was in that? It was Dansby Swanson, it was Marcus Stroman, it was Jamison Tyone, and Trey Mancini. Like that kind of speaks to where he was regarded in the clubhouse, right? It's he's in line with the big stars on the team because of what he had done because of the impact he had on the clubhouse so yeah like you might only see his batting average or you might only see uh his defensive performances when you're watching but make no mistake Trey Mancini had a big impact so it was not a a light decision to just designate him for assignment yeah and uh, you know again another that's baseball that's how it works out but unpredictable he had yeah over the course of his entire career he had averaged you know 24 homers and 75 rbi a year basically every single year and you know he had 35 homers just a couple of years ago so nobody thought that he would go three and a half months with hitting one homer so right. it was it's you know definitely an interesting 
um, case. But again, I think it speaks to just the aggressiveness of where the Cubs are at. So we're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about pitching. Obviously, we talked about Candelaria impacting the lineup. But we'll talk a little bit about pitching and then some storylines we're going to watch for the rest of this 2023 season. Get your Wintrust exclusive debit card. Get your Cubs card. Ooh, I'll take one. How much? Actually, they pay you $300. You heard right. Get a $300 bonus when you open a Cubs checking account with Wintrust. Enjoy all perks and purchase with pride every time with your Wintrust Cubs debit card. $300? What? I'll take a card. $300? Get your exclusive card at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Only $100 required to open. No monthly minimum balance and no monthly maintenance fees. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. All right, welcome back into the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Tony Andraki, Andy Martinez, Tim Stebbins. And guys, we, we spent a lot of time obviously talking about the offense, the position player group, pitching wise. We've spoken about just the aggressiveness of this team. They're, we know the direction. It, it's very clear that it was obvious. Uh, they're buyers, they're going for the division or the wild card or whatever. They're playoff contenders. How can you be a playoff contender, though, if, if the guy who is your ace for much of this year, Marcus Stroman, continues to have you know a nine year array like he has the last six, seven times out? So I think. Stroman getting right is emerging as probably the most important factor now. After the deadline's passed, after the Cubs have picked a lane, it's getting Stroman back to the guy that had a sub 2 3 ERA and was legitimately in line to possibly, or at least in the conversation, to start the NL All Star game and was a clear NL All Star. Uh, but getting him back to who he was up in, uh, until London, really. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the biggest storyline. We talk about some, like, one of my favorite one of my favorite cliches right was when you have a guy like maybe recovering from tommy john or big surgery and you know they're coming back in august and and they come back and you're like oh it's like a it's like a trade acquisition yeah. right like in, in a lot of ways but you're gonna say that right now right so, exactly yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. in a lot of ways if you can get them right that is like <laughs> a trade acquisition right you're bringing back the guy that you you had look i he was great he was cy young candidate all-star candidate whatever all-star starter candidate whatever you whatever metric you want to use whatever award you want to use he was that good you knew there was bound to be some regression just given at his career numbers. I don't think anyone could have predicted this kind of regression. Like this is kind of insane regression. You kind of figure he has to get back somewhere in between what he is now and what he was at the beginning of the season. But you're right. Like if they don't they need to figure that out soon because one of the, what I thought even a month ago, what I thought made the Cubs such no nonsense buyers was the fact that you had a one two punch and with Kyle Hendricks pitching like he is and and this was before Tyon went on his run like that was the kind of rotation you want in the postseason right like Justin Steele Marcus Stroman at his peak Kyle Hendricks was pitching really well like that's a one two three punch that you want especially in a three game set that you feel good about your chances in winning in a three game set that it kind of made sense as to why the Cubs should be buyers because that's the number one thing you look for in the postseason when he's struggling like that, that kind of that's a big, big step down in terms of it's just Justin Steele and maybe Kyle Hendricks, and you hope that Jameson Tyon keeps pitching like he is, because then maybe that's your one, two, three. But Stroman was signed and is your your number one guy, and you want him to be that number one guy, or at least that number two guy, given how Justin Steele's performing. You need to get him right, and and at all costs, like whatever it is. Is it injury? Maybe. David Ross mentioned that everyone's kind of dealing with something at this point in the season. It's a long season. Everyone's kind of – he had the blister issue earlier on. Like, it, it could be a number of things. We just don't know, but whatever it is, the, the Cubs need to figure it out sooner rather than later because if they want to get in the playoff race, they need him. And if they want, if they want to make a run in the playoffs, they need him. Yeah, and Tim, you know, just between Stroman or Drew Smiley, who was off to a fantastic start to the season, first 10 starts, you know, he was right up there with those guys, you know, in terms of Stroman and Steele with performing really well, pitching really well. But his last couple times out, you know, they've used an opener, Michael Fulmer and then Hayden Wesneski to go a couple innings, and then Smiley's come in. Now, he's projected to start here Wednesday night, but, uh, but like, and we're recording, obviously, before the game, so maybe we'll find out a bit more here. But I guess, Tim, just moving forward, you know, like, Cubs solidifying this rotation, figuring out what to do with Smiley, getting Stroman back on track. I mean, how how do they figure this out? Like, where do they go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think with Stroman, there's there's like regressing towards the mean or however you want to say it and maybe struggling, right? And I think it's been a struggle for, I guess you can say since the London Starlight, right? Like the blister issue knocked him out of that early. But since then, like it's it's been an extended stretch here. And I think the unfortunate part for the Cubs is Stroman struggles and, and Drew Smiley too have kind of coincided with 
Jamison Tyone, your big free agent splash, who in the first half was was that it was rough for him, right? He's he's gone the other way now, and uh, now the two guys who were really put the reason this team is where it is is because for a long period there, Stroman, Smiley, Steele, and obviously Hendricks were stepping up and contributing well. So uh, I would Smiley like with Stroman for one, I think I would just trust the track record, and and maybe it is just a matter of like we're saying the information. We'll see what we find out more. Maybe there's just something that's there for him, and and as time goes on, like he gets right, like it all com- comes back together. Uh, Smiley, like I, I do think with the opener situation, I wonder if that was just more matchup based with the Cardinals because those were the two starts, right? And and we know how that lineup is, and uh, I think after the first time on the home game against the Cardinals, and David Ross just say something along the lines of, "We just want him to have a bit of a softer landing and put him in a position for success." So. I, I don't know what you do to get them on track. I think Strowman, I really think it's a matter of time. And I think with Smiley, like, I think the second Cardinals star, I feel like other than, was it Lars Newbar again yeah, who hit a home yeah. run off him? He was pretty solid, so maybe that's a good sign. But I think at the end of the day, they have to trust the veteran track records of these guys who, like I said, they were, they're were they in this position because of how well those guys pitched for so long this season. Yeah, and I, I don't know that the Cubs have a ton of options. Um, you know, Adrian Sampson was not on the 40-man, but was just traded to the Rays in that deal for Roberson, like you were talking about Andy earlier in this pod. So he was one of the guys that was obviously in the rotation mix in spring training. Javier Assad, Hayden Wisniewski as well were right there in the mix. Wisniewski's, you know, up. He was he pitched two innings on Tuesday night. He pitched two innings before Smiley in St. Louis. Uh, and Assad, you know, is been incredible in the role that he's been in the bullpen so like yeah maybe it's easy to be like oh well you know put Stroman in the bullpen or maybe he has to go on the aisle with some sort of physical ailment put Smiley in the bullpen whatever it may be and just throw a side in the rotation well it doesn't work like that because then you're losing what has proven to be a very key cog in that bullpen with with a side and the way he's pitched the last month plus so I, I don't think it's quite as simple as that and you know the way Wesneski is pitched obviously has has been pretty good he was really good in AAA before coming up so maybe there's something there but yeah I agree I think you know figuring those two guys out uh solidifying that rotation it will be a huge huge key huge storyline to watch and I think too moving forward and we saw again going back to what we talked about the Cubs didn't do at the deadline was at a lefty with in the bullpen Brandon Hughes has been out all year he was the only lefty in the bullpen to start Anthony Kay has come up and uh, has mostly pitched in low leverage moments, but even in a low leverage moment Tuesday night, he gave up what four runs, five runs, or whatever in the ninth nine, after nine getting two outs. To the plate. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's those kind of performances that like it will make it hard for him to be in, in Ross's trust tree, right? Yeah. Like to to figure it out moving forward. So I don't know. I don't know what the Cubs do as a lefty option out of the bullpen. But like, you know, there's a, Smiley has done it before. There's a part of me that wonders like if his struggles maybe continue and, and they think it could, he could match up a little bit better as a reliever, maybe they do that. And then they have a lefty option and Wesneski's in rotation. I'm not sure, but I, I you know, going back to, to what you guys said, I am surprised that the Cubs weren't able to or didn't you know, get a lefty reliever out there because they don't really have many options and the internal guys are all guys who have either made you know pitch one game in the big leagues or, or no games in the big leagues in terms of left-handed relievers right that's that's the we talk about like soft landings for for young arms and we talked about it with jeremiah strata earlier in the year and we kind of talked about it the reverse with daniel palencia when he came up but like if you want if you bring up one of your lefties that you're you have in triple a whether it's like a bailey horn or a, a brendan little like that that isn't the, you don't want to necessarily bring them up in a pennant race, right? Yeah. And and it's an interesting conundrum because, like, a lot of these guys, like, think about it. Edward Alzali, he's been great in the closer role, but he didn't pitch a lot last year. Julian Merriweather's hitting the most innings he's pitched since he was a minor leaguer. Uh, Mark Leiter Jr. pitched, uh, I think, almost the same amount of innings as he's pitched this year, but remember, he was kind of used in that Javier Assad role last year or it made some starts. So the, the, the taxing nature that this bullpen has, has faced it kind of makes it more interesting that they didn't go out and get like another lefty, maybe Quas and 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 Roberson or, or some other guys in the Estrada can come back up or maybe Keegan Thompson who we had a good outing in AAA like maybe those guys can kind of start to figure it out and can can alleviate some of the some of the stress on on the bullpen. But it it, it is interesting what kind of happens over these last two months, especially as you're, you're chasing down the, the the Brewers and Reds. All right, so yeah, like you said, over the last the next two months coming up, um, Tim, we'll start with you. What are you watching for from this team? And, and we've talked about you know getting Stroman right as one of the top storylines, et cetera. But what stands out to you as something that you're particularly going to be like honed in on 
with this Cubs team as they make a push for a playoff spot. Well, not to keep nailing this point, but the pitching, I mean, we said yeah. Stroman, yeah. okay, that's one, but Justin Steele is next start, you know, he's he's going to surpass his career high in innings pitch. And we know yeah. last year, like he, I think the last month, right, he was he didn't pitch. So he's been one of the best pitchers in baseball this year, but he's nearing his career high in innings. Uh, Kyle Hendricks has obviously been really, really good since he came back. You hope that continues. Jameson tylen has been good since the All-Star break. What what does the last two months look like? What does Drew Smiley look like? Like I think it's the pitching and defense going into this year. That was the area we knew this would be a strength of theirs. And you know, there's been some ups and downs I think at different times, but by and large, that is that is not even by and large, that has been the case. And what does it look like as you get deeper into a season and you know, you have different variables that we're talking about with your rotation, like their success starts there. And there's different things that, like I just said, like you're gonna be kind of looking out for as you get deep into September and, and you're hoping to still, you're hoping to be making a push for October at that point. Andy, what stands out to you? What are you watching in the yeah, next couple of months? The pitching is, is the one thing, the bullpen, like I kind of mentioned is another thing, but I'm kind of curious to see how just the offense works over the last two months because as great as, as Tuesday was, that's not going to be the norm. And as uh, it, we've seen hot stretches. You, you know, they're the, not going to score 20 runs. <laughs> I mean, if, if, yeah, they, no. if they will, that's. What a hot take. Yeah, Andy. I know, I know. <laughs> um, but we've seen this offense before the trade deadline, before acquiring Jamer Candelario. We've seen them have good stretches. We've seen them have bad stretches. What's it going to look like now that it's a little bit deeper? Like, what are those cold stretches going to be like? Are those valleys maybe a little higher or a little less frequent? Are those peaks maybe a little longer? Are you maybe having like three or four games where you're putting up a lot of runs instead of having the the, the long stretches of, of of lack of production offensively? That's kind of what I'm going to be watching because, to your point, like pitching and defense is what this team's made of, and the defense is still as solid as ever, and the pitching. Uh, I, I kind of still think that it'll be somewhere around where it's been all season, and if that's the case, then it, it comes down to the offense being able to put up enough runs. And, and this acquisition of Jamer Candelario and, and and seeing what this kind of lineup can do, I think, is, is going to be worth watching. Yeah, it, for me, I, I think it just boils down to, like, how this division plays out. I mean, that's what I'm going to be watching. And, you know, we talked a little bit just about, like, scoreboard watching already, right, and the fact that, there is still two months left of the season. I think we were talking about that before the pod started, but, but just the fact that there is two months is, is kind of crazy. But I'm really, really interested to see if the Reds fall back to earth a bit, if the Brewers do. Now, both teams added maybe soft ads to the deadline, like I like the Canna and, and Santana pickups for the Brewers trying to address their offense. Brandon Woodruff is on his way back. If he can pair with Corbin Burns, like that's definitely the best one-two punch in the division. But the Reds are, have the 19th best run differential in baseball entering Wednesday's game. The Brewers are at 21st. Like these are teams both in the negative run differential, but they've been surviving like that and thriving like that for the last couple of months in the same way. They they have not had positive run differentials. I mean, the Reds did obviously. I think just right before this 20 game output, right or 20 run output the other night. Um, so I'm just curious if that comes back to earth a bit, and if the Cubs, the plus 67 run differential. Again, after a blowout, after a plus 11 on Tuesday night, but they're fifth best in baseball with that run differential. And for a, for a very long time, they have led the division run differential. They've been one of the only teams in the division, or I'm sorry, the only team in the division with a positive run differential. So I'm curious if that plays out. I mean, their Pythagorean record shows that they should be 60 and 47, while the Reds and Brewers would be right around 500 or just below. So like, in theory, on paper, the Cubs should be somewhat running away with this division. They're not running, but at least have a four, five, six game lead. Instead, they're chasing by four. So does that come back to earth? Does does baseball take place? And over the long six months, does that happen? Do the Reds talk about pitching? I mean, I'm Hunter Green may be on his way back, Nick, no, Nick Lodolo as well. But like some of these guys have already started to hit a wall. I mean, Ben Lively was, was pitching pretty well, and the Cubs let him up for 13 runs. Like, some, I'm curious to see if some of that falls back to earth at all and if the Cubs can take advantage of a stretch where, yeah, they have 10 still against Cincinnati and Milwaukee the rest of the year. They still have to play Atlanta in a couple of series, seven against Arizona. So some good games left. They also have 24 games against the Mets, White Sox, Royals, Tigers, Pirates, Rockies, all teams that got not only have been pretty bad to start, but they all got significantly worse yesterday at the deadline or in the past couple of weeks. I mean, the Mets, you were penciling that series next week as like, this could be a big series. Maybe it decides on the wild card. 
no Verlander, no Scherzer. Like, yeah, P. Alonso is still there, but like this is a drastically different mood and atmosphere on the Mets. And and yeah, I mean, there's a two week stretch where they play the the White Sox, Royals, Tigers, Pirates. Like, those are all teams flirting with last place and some of the worst records in baseball. That's another stretch where the Cubs could take advantage. I wouldn't be surprised if they rattle off another eight game win streak in there. But I think I, I'm that's what I'm watching. It's just how the Cubs play with their schedule and if baseball happens uh, where luck kind of centers out for for both of the, or for all of these teams for all three of these teams in the division so i don't know how it's going to play out it doesn't have to go that way but more often than not i think over a six month marathon season usually things kind of even themselves out so really curious to see if that happens here yeah it's it's going to be interesting and and that schedule i think is is the key point uh, uh, one of my favorite sets was looking back on from june 9th after after the sweep in L, in anaheim by the Cubs, they they have the third best record in baseball since that time, and I think the only two teams above them are the Reds and Braves, which the Braves you kind of understand, and then yeah. the Reds, the one team that you're chasing. So the, this this rest of the schedule is gonna be interesting. I'll I'll add this in too, like on on the schedule point, like when the Cubs were we talked about playing meaningful baseball and meaningful baseball in September in a non uh, 60 game shortened season, right? Like one thing that has changed since then, like 2019, is no more game 163s. The year before that, the Cubs played one, right? So tiebreakers are now what decides division, wild card spots, et cetera, right? And these games with the Reds this week and, and the Brewers, you know, coming up and then ending the season, like they could be huge. They're, they're two and five against the Reds right now. They're three and four against Milwaukee. Like, if we're saying, like, whatever happened, maybe the Reds, maybe as the season goes on, like, maybe stuff catches up to them. Like, that last series, and this is looking way too far ahead with Milwaukee, like, yeah. You don't know what that could yeah. mean, but in any case, we know right now this series against the Reds is huge because you're already trailing in the season series, and coming up in a few weeks with Milwaukee, it's the same thing. So, like, I think right now, as we're saying, the, these guys have really started to come together. You said since June, like, how, how well they've been playing. Like, you got to carry it through right now and get through this stretch with them, and then you get to that part of your schedule where hopefully they can take off more and really solidify themselves atop the standings. Yeah, that series against Milwaukee to end the year I think is going to be big and um, it would definitely be a shame if you were planning a wedding around that time and you were the social media manager for Marquee Sports Network. That would be a really tough weekend, particularly that Saturday to plan a wedding for. So uh, that would definitely be difficult, especially, you know, if somebody who covers the team is standing in up in the wedding and, you know, would normally maybe be in Milwaukee or at least like looking to cover that series. So, yeah, you know, that uh, definitely, you know, if you had a chance to plan that, I would definitely not recommend planning it for that Saturday. Crazy hypothetical. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, But, uh, you know, one more note I kind of wanted to just leave on before this pod is I touched on it a little bit, but like I think kind of speaking more to Cubs fans here is just like, enjoy this like yeah the fact that the cubs are planning playing meaningful games in august august and september and like for the first time being back in you know in wrigley field after the pandemic like this is this is interesting this is fun this is why you're a fan right and so i think it's really cool and i'm again i'm looking forward to being around i'm looking forward to you know wrigley bumping and in august and september here and like you know as the weather starts to turn cold and the cubs are still playing meaningful games or maybe turns cold i guess who knows it's chicago but like (laughs) you know i think i think it's just really cool and and, you know going back to like that every season is sacred that jed hoyer and theo epstein have talked here for over a decade about like i think the cubs really took that to heart and have been aggressive and and that doesn't happen all the time and so i just think it's it's cool to see and and from a cubs fan perspective it's definitely something to enjoy and just to see how whatever happens from here like it's cool it's cool to be in this position and and i think the cubs this is where they wanted to be so from their perspective I, you know it's got to be a big load off like this is what nico horner and dansby swanson and, and other guys ian Happ have wanted they wanted cody bellinger to stay they wanted marcus stroman to stay so now they have a chance to go prove it and see what they can do as a group so that'll be really cool really valuable really really interesting thing just to watch at wrigley field all year so that'll do it for this week uh week's week's edition of the cubs weekly podcast presented by Wintrust. don't forget to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcast Check us out in video form on the brand new Marquee Sports Network app or on YouTube. For Tim and Andy, I'm Tony. Thanks for listening and tuning in.